Hi, everyone. This is Abhishek from ShakeTheCosmos.com. My guest today is Vitaly Lomakin, and I am excited to talk with Vitaly. Uh, we met through a mutual friend. And again, if you're listening to this episode right now, hit that follow button or subscribe button. Also, if you want to give it a rating, give me a rating. That helps me appear in the organic research results. And I'm really excited to talk with Vitaly today because he joined the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering in September 20, uh, 2005 at UCSD. And I'm just, I, I'm happy, I'm excited to learn about the research side of things as well. And he's received his master's in science degree from Kharkiv National University, Ukraine in 1996, and his PhD degree from Tel Aviv University, Israel in 2003, both in electrical engineering. And while completing his PhD dissertation, he was an instructor in the Department of Electrical Engineering at Tel Aviv. He worked part-time for Xelent, an Israeli high-tech company. In 2002 to 2005, he was a postdoctoral associate and visiting assistant professor in the Center for Computational Electromagnetics at the University of Illinois at Urban Ch Ch Urbana Champaign. His research interests include analytical and numerical methods for studying electromagnetic fields in complex configurations, as well as applications in these methods for the analysis and design of novel devices and systems. He teaches core undergraduate level courses in electrical engineering and electromagnetics and assist in the development of a graduate sequence in the electromagnetics and optics. Well, really pleasure to have you on the show, Vitaly. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. It's my, my pleasure. Awesome. <laughs> well, I hear you've been uh, doing some uh, yoga recently as well. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, what, what kind of changes have you noticed uh, within with trying some of the yoga that you, you're, you're doing? Oh, I, uh, in short, yoga is great. <laughs> I, I I do have a lot of experience uh, in life in doing sports uh, until maybe the age of 25. I was engaged in, in um, more or less two sports, uh, running and boxing, mostly boxing. Uh, and I did a lot of sports. So I, I, I'm a pretty athletic in general, uh, but I've never done yoga and actually uh, before more or less half a year ago i considered yoga as uh, being something slow and uh, i thought not in interesting uh, then i tried it and i tried it and i tried it and i and then and that's it i'm i'm completely hooked up now uh, we do it every day uh, now uh, one hour every day in the morning and also uh, maybe 20 minutes before going to bed. Uh, and uh, it really made a change in, in how I take my body. Uh, I really can say that I can feel my body right now and I couldn't before. Uh, basically, I know where my fingers are, where my toes are, and, and I can feel and know how to position them. It's, uh, that's how I feel. And, and this is a, a, in addition to feeling my muscles and being stretched and just feeling great in general. Wow. Well, I appreciate that and how you, you're finding yoga to be an uh, addition in, uh, to, in your lifestyle as well. And in terms of what you, what you do, is you're, you're actively involved in a lot of research uh, as well. And, you know, would love to kind of understand little bit more about that world so like what what um how did you get into research uh, and uh, you know just so somebody who has no idea what what that is yeah sure uh, so i would say uh it started from my high school i cannot say it was really research uh but i was involved uh, my, my my dad uh, had the a business kind of electrical engineering he was an electrical engineer, and I, I was involved in his business, basically ma ma building stuff, uh, building some automatic si automated systems at the time. It was not, these were not computer systems, but some automated systems, actually making them. Uh, then uh, two of my uh, uncles uh, uh, are professors um, in, in Russia, 
And uh, at the time, I was uh, looking up to them and uh, thinking, oh, wow, I, want to be, I would like to be a professor. And my dad said, I remember, uh, you know, just being a, an engineer is great, but I, I, you, uh, I would rather you, you being a professor. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. Uh, and then when I went to school in Kharkov, in Kharkiv, in Ukraine, uh, more or less, I thought I, I would be, be a professor. Uh, yeah, and that's how it started. And then at school, I, I, I did pretty well. And then at the end, maybe on my fourth year, I started uh, started being engaged in some research with, with a professor who was great. Um, uh, his, his last name is called Chigin, a great guy. And so I started doing that research. And then little by little, I, I published papers. And then I wanted to go to Israel. Uh, actually, that was interesting. Uh, I did my uh, dissertation, a master's dissertation, in a particular area uh, in which I used uh, papers uh, by a professor from Israel. But at the time, and I really loved the, the, those papers. Uh, the na his name is Ehud Heyman. I really loved his papers and enjoyed them and really just loved them. And then when, when I was moving to Israel, one month before going there, I learned that uh, he, he was from uh, from Israel, from Tel Aviv, where I was going. So it was a, this kind of coincidence. And then I, I came and I said, you know, I, I want to be your student. And, and then I started my PhD program there. Have you? And have, that's how it started. Have you found that to be a theme? Um, to be a theme where it, it, there is this community of research. Uh, people who around the world like you you were a student and then you reached out to somebody in israel uh about is there a connection uh when it becomes in the world of research yeah everybody actually is connected uh we do similar kind of work we have to interact to learn from each other and it, it's like a community like in, in our particular community we go to conferences well now with COVID, we don't but uh, uh, but uh, typically we would go to maybe three, four, five conferences a year. We would all meet. Uh, all these communities, these are great people, very interesting people. So we interact. Yes, there is uh, there is this this kind of com community. Yes. So uh, and um, yeah, yeah, and and the doing research is uh, something extremely interesting. And being a professor is very interesting. Yes. What 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 makes it so interesting? Like I I wonder like, yeah. What it, what what do you find so interesting uh, in research? Uh, first of all, because uh, there is no uh, boundaries. It's more or less. It's uh, it depends on you. It's up to you. Of course, there are boundaries of um, science and physics and maybe the laws of physics, but I mean there are no boundaries of what you can do. Uh, it's it's all you it's up to you basically you come as a young guy say to ucsd uc san diego or to any 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 university and uh, you are almost on your own and just go and you just if you come up with ideas you start investigating and then a little by, by little it leads to something new and exciting and uh, and it can be you. You may start from one area of study and evolve into something else. Uh, and again, there is no limit. Wow. And that is extremely interesting. I, I've never <laughs> thought about it that way, but that that makes so much sense. Is there is there an example of something that in your work or you have seen in research that you felt like, oh wow, yeah, like they really question the boundaries of research and. Yeah, I, I might give an example, maybe a few, but uh, maybe one example that just comes to my mind uh, at, at the moment. Uh, so we had this project uh, with um, uh, another professor from our department, Professor Shai Feynman, amazing person. Um, so it was a project supported by DARPA on uh, uh, making the smallest laser ever. Uh -huh. And the project started from all this nothing, just uh, submitting a proposal of how possibly we could make such a device. That was ba basically based on ideas that we know from the microwave engineering, 
and possibly transferring them to optics. But we had no idea if it would work even. And uh, we uh, we got the grant funding. We need funding for doing research. Uh, and uh, we worked, we worked, we tried, and we, we maybe failed a little bit, and then we tried, and then it did work. So from just an idea uh, to having some uh, uh, developments, analytical and uh, conceptual developments, to some numerical tests and verifications, and then to experiment done by, uh, by, by, by Professor Feynman. Uh, and then we did, uh, we made actually a laser, which was the smallest laser at the time. And actually maybe it is still is the smallest laser, semiconductor based laser. Now in the future, hopefully these devices will be used for integrated uh, uh, photonic chips uh, as uh, small laser sources. But it started from basically nothing, from an idea. And it is uh, extremely fulfilling and satisfying. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just an idea of a small laser, but it didn't exist, and it existed after so long. Yeah, you mentioned like there were these failures that happen at during the research. Uh, what keeps people going? Because you know, it sounds like there are multiple failures, maybe you know, iterations or um, that happen during research. What motivates? You know, somebody. To yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, even when you have, uh, when you fail, it's interesting. Just knowing how you fail is also uh, knowledge. And also, in, in fact, uh, it, it's good to be able to both to build something and break it. Even um, and so I'm, and my uh, uh, research field is more so, uh, software and developing codes and then uh, simulations. But like when we develop a code, uh, we, we want to be able to model something or to run this code to model a device. But then uh, we also want to be able to know what parameters to put such that the simulation breaks and to control you don't know how it breaks and to learn from that so i guess uh, when you you have a failure in your research it teaches you how to do better next time and i really see this connection also to uh, to life in general if you have a fail in life somewhere you should uh, take it positively and just say that it's an experience yeah i, I appreciate i mean this this mental model of uh learning from failures uh, and uh, I, I guess so um but like how how are the as as in the research as the failures are happening how do like the students handle it as well like what are what it like is uh how can they be how can how do they support how do they feel supported? Um, I, I think at least my students i love all my students i, I when i say students uh, we uh, might want to separate them into undergraduate students who take classes and into PhD students who do research. They also take the graduate level classes usually. And so I'm talking about the graduate uh, students, the uh, PhD students. Yeah, of course, they, they do fail in certain sense. But uh, it, in, in my experience, everybody is super positive. Everybody is doing well. And yeah, just like I'm saying, of course, uh, the role of an advisor, of the advisor, is to support and assist and explain and but it's mostly the students who who do the work usually and i would say most students just understand the game and uh, and learn <laughs> do, you, do you feel this game of the research this game of uh is, is it changing have you seen it evolve uh, over the years uh in your time that you, you've been doing uh research I would say uh, fundamentally, I don't think it's it, it, it's changing really fundamentally how people are. I don't think the nature of people is changing too much, at least from what, what I would say. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, how research is, is going and what we do, of course, is, uh, is involved. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. That's fascinating. So. Like what is what is day to day like for for professor, um, you know, you know, like I guess now it's of course very very different with in this in this COVID situation. But what is a typical day? <laughs> uh, so so uh, as a professor, we we have more like roughly speaking three kind uh, 
uh, kinds of work. Uh, it's teaching, research, and what, what is called service. So teaching is kind of clear, right? We, we teach, we, we, we give classes. Research is also clear, and, and, and service is uh, reviewing papers, uh, maybe serving on various committees. Um, yes, so that, that's, that's what is called service. Or so maybe organizing conferences. Um, so so more, more or less your day is, is split maybe in these three areas. Uh, we don't teach every day, uh, but still you may want to prepare for some classes. Uh, depending on what classes, uh, maybe every day depends. Um, so, so let's say if you have a class and you teach that class, uh, then you interact with uh, with students, uh, both with undergraduate students for classes and with uh, graduate students or PhD students for research. And then you do your own uh, your own work in research, which means for me, for example, uh, I. I uh, I do some mathematical maybe derivations. I sometimes I just sit and think, uh, and uh, I, I I do I write a lot of uh, codes, mm. like numerical codes. Yeah, uh, and 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 then uh, you do reviews. Basically, you read a paper, say and say say, and and write a report if you like it or not. If it can be published or not, and then you do some uh, you serve on some committees. That's basically what we do. So there is um, uh, a nice thing is, is that it's not structured in that you don't have to be at work from eight to five. Uh, you kind of go with your schedule, except of classes, of course, classes are scheduled. Uh, but then it also means that you work all the time. Mm. You, 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 because if you do not have structure, then you work. <laughs> right. Yeah. Unless I... you do sports and maybe you go somewhere, but otherwise you basically work all the time. What what have you found helpful? Uh, because you're right. Like if it's it's not nine to five, it could you could kind of just work all the time. What have you found helpful to kind of keep a balance uh, between the things? Mm, it, it's the thing is that working for me is not working, but enjoying actually. Mm. So in this sense, uh, in in fact, if, if something not so pleasant happens actually i don't remember when <laughs> it happened but but let's say something not so pleasant happens uh, i often would just uh, not even even uh, not telling myself consciously but unconsciously i would just not think about that particular unpleasant uh, thing but would start working on something interesting wow. so you can always find something interesting to work on so i i, I it's kind of work but also not so much work i so, appreciate this i mean i I, I never knew the, like how much layers there are to research and in terms of like uh, applying some of the research that people do. And, you know, I, I think you mentioned you were maybe at some point an expert witness uh, in, in a case. Uh, how did that come about? Like, uh, <laughs> Oh yeah. Yeah. So we talk, I remember we talked about that. Yeah. Uh, it's a, an expert witness in a criminal court actually. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, that was a, an interesting experience. It, so in, in courts, uh, whenever things happen, right, uh, sometimes um, there are certain technologies that can be admitted or not admitted in court. And it, it has a lot of influence on the, uh, it may have a, a significant influence on the decision because, it, you know, if it can be admitted that a person, say, was in a particular place due to a particular indication from a technology, then uh, it's a big deal. Uh, but then uh, how do you know? So the court by itself cannot know. It should be established. Uh, so it is established through an expert. And then they, uh, the court can establish that, that a particular person can be an expert in a certain field. Like, for example, I did work in electromagnetics, acoustics, and, and magnetics. So I, I could qualify as an expert in these areas if there is a technology related to that area. So that was how it went. So I was invited and they qualified I qualified me. And then, uh, yeah, I kind of made the, my expert opinion if that technology can or cannot be admitted. Uh, one thing actually that, I, uh, that was interesting to me, so when I uh, came there, when I had this, uh, this here uh, for the first time, um, I came prepared with uh, various references. You know, when we write a paper, we, we, we cite references. 
you know, to, to have justification to various things that we do. Let's say you do some research, you don't do everything in your paper. You rely on some knowledge. So what is that knowledge is a reference, right? You cite it. Um, so I prepared uh, papers with citations, with references and all that. Uh, but then the judge said, no, we, we don't really need that. Once we establish you as an expert, you are the reference. <laughs> wow. That was, that was interesting to me. <laughs> That's interesting. I mean, it sounds like still like spending time in research can then make somebody like an expert in, in that one particular topic that could be useful in other parts of life, like um, yeah. maybe, maybe mm -hmm. it's, uh, the legal system, but there's also, I guess, business. Business could also be a place for research. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, so I'm in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. So engineering, and engineering is used in uh, in industry. I mean, in, in, the, the, there is a lot of engineering in industry. I mean, and uh, um, yes. So if you take uh, various people in our department and other departments, you can see that uh, uh, people have companies. Uh, actually, Qualcomm. You know, Qualcomm started from our department. I did not uh, know that. I did not know that. Yeah, my professors from our department. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, there are many companies that uh, people uh, open and start, uh, and uh, it's it's one aspect. So you 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 could have a company sometimes, um, and in, in general, if you are a full time professor, you cannot really have full time in, engagement with a company. Uh, but some people can take one or two years off. And, and work with the company, or uh, they they can be again experts, uh, consultants. Uh, this is an, an, another uh, uh, kind of way of doing business. Uh, and also, we do a lot of research projects with companies. Uh, also, uh, like large companies and also small companies uh, do a lot of research. Sometimes their research is, uh, I mean, not sometimes, many times, is at the same or, or might be even higher level than at, at a, a university. Uh, like our PhD students actually go to work in those companies to do research. And uh, those research projects are extremely interesting. It, you see how what you do applies to a technology, and then if what you do goes into technology, you kind of can see the impact. That is uh, that is also very interesting. Yeah, I mean, do you, the impact of uh, of the research uh, is interesting as well. I guess, uh, but it, I mean, uh, I guess, uh, how do you measure impact uh, of something like research, uh, where um, or how do you think about that? So, so uh, there are even ways of measuring impact, which are implemented sometimes in promotions, <laughs> like even numerical numbers sometimes. <laughs> and uh, so one way in terms of academic research is to see how many times your paper has been cited and how many times and, and how many papers have been cited uh, a certain number of times. Because, you know, if somebody cites your paper, that means that they use your results. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then... Uh, uh, for me, uh, in, in code development, I, I would consider the impact is how many people, how many companies use your, your codes. Because again, they use the codes and uh, they use it for something useful and for maybe improving some technology, that's an impact. Or may, maybe uh, people also write patterns uh, if your pattern has been used. Like uh, we have people in our department who have like amazing partners which uh, which are used or will be used by companies so that's a big impact right um yeah that's i mean i think it's i mean this this uh, or, or, or say if your idea goes into technology again mm. yeah basically if it uh, impacts or affects other people's lives more or less yeah that's awesome i mean yeah and it's uh, especially with the just the mindset of having no boundaries when it comes to research uh, is amazing, and how maybe the impact also is uh, sort of uh, maybe another high. example of kind of going from an idea to a device. 
uh, in uh, uh, there is a, a particular phenomenon which is called spin transfer torque. It's like electrons uh, can uh, can uh, spin like kind of rotate uh, around the orbit in, in a particular. Uh, in, I mean, it can be say left or right, just in, in a simple way, and it's called spin. And, and then you, you can have current which, which gets spin polarized and can affect little magnets say, switching them. And uh, and this this kind of uh, effect. Uh, was predicted in uh, 1996, uh, uh, but that can be used for magnetic memories, and and now uh, magnetic memories uh, are being shipped. What is so, magnetic memory? Is that something like in our phone or like? No, no, uh, where would I see some, a magnetic in, memory? In, in some of uh, in some might be. I don't remember, but it just started. It's uh, it's okay. it can be used for certain uh, for certain devices, but it just uh, it's very new. And you know the hope is that it will it will be, become the mainstream for many devices. Wow. Uh, but it's interesting that it started from an idea in '96, and, and then it's like what 20 say 24 years later there is a device, like from theory to the device in 20 in 20 years more or less. That's fascinating. It's, it, it, it sounds very interesting. Well, and you know and just the applications of it. Maybe it's a better is it is maybe a better storage device or a better light. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's. Uh, it has some advantages in terms of storage. It's, it's something that is called non-volatile storage. That is, if it goes into your computer memory and you say uh, turn uh, uh, the power off, the memory actually will stay. Not forever, but more or less practically forever for you. Wow. Yeah. Well, that sounds pretty good. I'd like to have that in my computer. <laughs> <laughs> you will. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Well, I mean, so it, as you think about some of the research that's ongoing in your in your industry, what's something that you're really excited about that you know kind of feels like it's it's going to be really something cool in the next 10, 20 years uh, as you think about trends? Uh, hmm. Well. Uh, I, I would say uh, well, uh, some things that we already know. Um, there are certain areas like in engineering related to, say, 5G. I just uh, recently was on an exam, and uh, uh, to me it was very uh, PhD exam. To me, it was very interesting what they do there in terms of antenna development and system development. Um, then, uh, uh, in terms of um, I, I'm involved in the subject of magnetism, nanomagnetism. Uh, again, uh, new kinds of memory. That that would be uh, very interesting if if it goes into products and if it can maybe improve them. Uh, then then again, uh, small lasers and and integrated systems. Say so if you can integrate photonic uh, systems with uh, microwave systems uh, and like computing systems. In terms of transfer uh, information, transfer information, and also processing. So I would kind of like just on top of my head, I would say I would say that those things are interesting. Well, I can I that I mean that's going to be fascinating when some of those technologies come out of research and become part of daily life. Also in computing, actually. Um, so in in the past, you know, you would run your simulations on a single core. Then maybe it would have a computer computer system system um, uh, many processors like parallel computing. Right now, of course, we all know there are uh, multi core systems, and there are massively multi core systems like graphics processing units. But then they develop into uh, they kind of evolve into a very com complex systems where you kind of collocate uh, graphics processors and the uh, Central processors and um, just all these developments into computing systems uh, are very interesting. And uh, like in terms of uh, developing codes, which we, we do, uh, to me it's extremely interesting because uh, there will be some breakthroughs and, and differences, I believe, in the future. Wow. Of course, there is something that's called neuromorphic computing. Uh, so we we have some center. Of, uh, uh, on for neuromorphic computing in our department, um, it, it, it's uh, managed by 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 professor in physics, and uh, uh, I'll show you his name. Uh, so and uh, there, uh, it's new paradigms in terms of computing. So this would be uh, potentially not just a um, discrete processing. But some processing which is related to how our brain works, 
So the question is, can we develop system and design systems uh, such that uh, we can do comp computations on a different level, possibly much faster and or with much less uh, energy? Because wow. our brain is, is, is amazing. At, uh, I don't remember exactly. I think it's like 10 watt only, something like that. I, hmm. I forgot. Uh, but it, it, the process is amazing. So the efficiency is astonishing. Wow. So the question is if, if it can do something similar you know, on the device level. It, so it that, becomes that clo closer to the brain um, efficiency. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, but, but there is this whole area of neuromorphic computing. Mm. Uh, and um, it's it's not directly related, but this is related to artificial intelligence also. And wow. um, yeah, so all, all these areas, I believe, will, will be developing very fast and well, very excited. That's awesome. As, as we're wrapping up here, you know, really appreciate you sharing these trends. And what would be your, you know, suggestion, like, uh, for somebody who wants to get into research or, uh, you know, is listening to this? And uh, what would be your, your uh, lesson to them? Uh, yes. First of all, everybody is invited. I really do think that uh, this area is fascinating and great. And um, uh, especially if we have here people from uh, students from high schools, I really encourage them to basically just go on the a university website, look at the website, look at the faculty members. Um, and uh, if you have a an interest, just write emails. Oh, wow. Hey, I, uh, my name is this and this. I like science. Can I join your lab just for a summer project? Uh, can I do some internship? Can I uh, do any possible projects? That is extremely helpful and, and useful for, for you. And that, uh, that is also uh, helpful in terms of getting to the school later and basically understanding what it is about. Wow. Yeah, and then get a foot in the door and then see what research is about. Yeah. I love that. Yes. Thank yes. you. Yes, I, I really do think it's very helpful. Awesome. Well, really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this was such an exciting uh, thing to talk about. Yeah, sure. All right. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. Hey, everyone. Thank you for listening. Please hit the subscribe button. We'll be